So we'll have a look at what the literature tells us about GHB. Um, in fact, here in Victoria, in Melbourne, we've done a number of the studies around GHB that really informed clinical practice, so uh, we're pretty proud of that. Paul Dietz and his colleagues did a, a study when GHB was first um, coming into uh, Victoria and into other parts of the world, a retrospective analysis in the early 2000s looking at a comparison between ambulance attendances at GHB overdoses and heroin overdoses, still at that time, and and even now heroin was um, much more common, but only about a fifth of the patients who had taken a heroin overdose needed transport to hospital. Uh, other patients after a dose of naloxone or, or uh, um, good supportive care could, could um, potentially go on their way, but the GHB patients were profoundly unwell and the vast majority required transport to hospital. So we did a study at St Vincent's, I wasn't directly involved, but some of my colleagues certainly were, uh, Vanita um, Munir um, and another number of the other emergency physicians and our research personnel at a very similar time to when Paul was doing his study, looked at 170 attendances um, in the emergency department over that period of time and worldwide and certainly uh, in, in Australia it's the same times, it's weekends in that 4am to 8am period of time that we see the vast majority of these presentations and Monday public holiday is also a very common time. I'm told actually that what happens is patients have their night out taking uh, stimulants, drinking alcohol, and then they know they're going to go home and not be able to sleep very well, so they get their taxi or their Uber and they take their GHB, which they think is just going to help uh, sedate them a little bit and give them sleep, and we've had many cases of people becoming um, unconscious in the taxi on the way home and hence having to need to come to the emergency department. Patients, when they arrive, they're really sick. You don't get uh, a higher category than an, uh, an Australian triage category of one. The other things that qualify are cardiac arrest, you know, profound comas in this stage, or severe patient agitation. And most patients arrive, you know, uh, around about half with a profound alteration in their conscious state. But we only need to intubate a really small percentage of these patients. And we'll see the work that Vanita and her colleagues did to, to show us that. Most patients within three or four hours are ready to go home. In fact, they're actually quite an easy cohort of patients to manage. I'm more than happy to pick up a, uh, a GHB overdose in the wee hours in the morning because I know I'm not going to need to do much. The nurse does need to. They need to give close nursing observation by knowing in a couple of hours. The patient will be awake. I'll give them my GHB talk. It uh, tends to go in one ear and out the other, and uh, they can usually go on their way. So how did we discover that we didn't really need to intubate these patients? Um, Vanita and some other colleagues, including uh, Paul Dietz as well, had a look at um, uh, our hospital, St Vincent's, compared to the Alfred Hospital. We, had, we were managing these very differently at the time, whereas at St Vincent's we had realised that we probably didn't need to intubate the vast majority of these patients. At the, at the Alfred they were just uh, intubating uh, most of these patients. Anyone who arrives at the emergency department with a GCS less than eight, our saying there is GCS less than eight intubate. Um, so this is one of the rare circumstances where, you know, profound coma, we know we don't necessarily need to intubate these patients. So again, they found it was the same cohort of patients, young people, weekends, early hours of the morning, um, again, profoundly comatose. At the Alfred, about a third of them got intubated, and we intubated only around 6% at that time. And intubation had just seemed to increase their length of stay by almost 50%. And greatly increased their, risk, their, their uh, need for hospital admission, you know, an odds ratio of 10. But there didn't seem to be any um, increase in adverse outcomes from a conservative approach. So really ar around the world now, based on a lot of this literature, um, GHB overdoses don't need to be intubated within certain caveats, obviously. So in terms of deaths, um, there certainly are deaths, and this retrospective review in the early 2000s, uh, this was in Australia, there were 10 confirmed deaths. Again, this is probably the tip of the iceberg. At that time, uh, I, I was speaking to Morris from the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine earlier today. You know, it, it, only until quite recently did they start actually actively testing for GHB. So many deaths would have gone un, um, uh, unattributed, uh, but probably had GHB as a, a component. And out of these 10 deaths, eight were GHB was the only substance um, present in the patient and uh, the, the death has been attributed essentially just to the GHB.
Um, one of those cases, I don't know if any of you remember, there was a case of a, uh, a nurse who went on a cruise and she was surreptitiously administered uh, GHB and was uh, uh, assaulted by a number of men and, and uh, died on that cruise. And so the, the death of Diane Brimble was included in this um, uh, retrospective review. There's been a number of international deaths. This study looks at the UK, uh, US um, and Canada. Um, 226 deaths, the vast majority from cardiorespiratory arrest. And essentially, not a single, there was one death that occurred in hospital, that was someone who was transported already in cardiac arrest. So if you get to an emergency department alive, you do not die from GHB. So one of the messages for people, if people do get into trouble, is certainly to, to seek medical care. A number of these deaths, the people were left to sleep it off, they just uh, uh, having a nap or geeing out, and subsequently were found by people to to, um, to have died. Um, in a third of those cases, there were no co-ingestants. So certainly, GHB is a, it has potential lethality. There was uh, another very interesting cohort of cases in Australia and elsewhere. It was first discovered in Australia, a couple of children who presented to emergency departments profoundly comatose for no good reason seemed to wake up three or four hours later. They had urine drug screens, and I don't know how in a urine drug screen, but they somehow detected that uh, um, these patients uh, had GHB, and these B these um, uh, Bindi's balls that were a children's toy essentially when ingested uh, released 1,4-butanodiol. Uh, so uh, um, it was um, those couple of cases caused a, world, caused a worldwide withdrawal of those uh, children's toys. Um, something that I only found about recently when uh, um, uh, preparing another paper and having a look at some of the work that uh, ha is coming out of Holland, there are a number of patients who have recurrent coma. We've certainly seen people in the emergency department who have come in for the fourth, fifth, sixth time with GHB overdoses, and there does seem to be this persistent problem with um, memory, especially working and lo long-term memory in people who have had um, a number of comas from GHB. Dependence and withdrawal, we see a lot of drug and alcohol use problems uh, at St Vincent's. I've only been involved in a couple of cases, but I'm led to believe it's an emerging problem. There are people taking GHB multiple doses every day. Very soon after taking their last dose, they can develop quite a profound withdrawal syndrome. Patients have died, needed intubating. There's been patients needing quite prolonged ICU stays. The, the, the withdrawal is it, it's similar to alcohol withdrawal in a number of respects, but much more marked. The, the delirium and the uh, psychosis is much more prof profound and lasts much longer. Uh, a, a couple of the deaths have been due to hypothermia, and there's been some muscle breakdown in some of the others, and uh, hence result in kidney failure. Um, and th there's even been reported deaths just from the withdrawal syndrome too. The, the treatment is just supportive. We don't have any really good antidotes. Benzodiazepines seem to be our best antidote in a lot of, uh, you know, his first line for a lot of overdose, a lot of um, withdrawal and dependence scenarios. Baclofen's been trialled, as have the antipsychotics, but we don't really have um, a really good and certainly no uh, antidote to toxicity or, and no really good drugs for the withdrawal syndrome as well. So in summary, GHB has a very narrow therapeutic index. The coma is uh, very short-lived, uh, luckily. Deaths are rare but do occur. Good supportive care if you get to emergency services tends to ensure a good outcome in all cases. But there are some emerging themes in terms of longer-term effects as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. You didn't once refer to it uh, as GPH, grievous bodily harm. But that's also another name for it, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. First question. Is urine and blood testing useless in emergency departments is said to be useless everywhere else? Absolutely. So from an emergency clinician's point of view, there is almost no circumstance where a urine drug screen is uh, helpful to us. They take too long to come back. They don't tell us the concentration. They don't, uh, it's not a, um, uh, an all-encompassing screen, and it doesn't change our management at all. We manage things based on the toxidrome that the patient has. It doesn't really matter what substance they've had. We manage um, based on the, the, the signs and symptoms at that time. Our psychiatry colleagues sometimes want it, and that's more for, for monitoring the veracity of what patients tell them and also for more long-term care. But essentially, from an emergency physician's experience, I never need a urine drug screen. Uh, 
How do you maintain airway protection if GCS3 and GHB affected patient not intubated? Yeah. So it's really interesting. Obviously, if you're profoundly comatose, there's always a risk of aspiration if gastric contents do come up. Um, these patients are not intubated, but they get very good one-on-one -on -one nursing care, nursed on their side, very close monitoring, suction at the ready, and if there is any vomiting or, or uh, aspiration, then you know care can be heightened. But what we've seen is that those are actually very rare events. It's um, We see, I would say, on average four or five cases every Saturday and Sunday morning, and it's very rare for us to see any significant complications. The registrars who are on overnight, uh, you know, th they see the vast majority of these cases, and they do intubate some patients, especially if they come in vomiting and comatose, but um, I, I can't remember the last bad experience we had with a GHB patient. All right, so someone comes into ED with a uh, Glasgow score of three to eight. How do you differentiate um, toxicity with GHB from any other cause? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Uh, our ambulance colleagues are amazing. It's incredible in, in both GHB overdoses and everything else, the, the, the uh, Ambulance Victoria crews bring these guys in. They know, they've been at the scene, they've spoken to people at the scene. P drug takers, they're usually relatively honest uh, in terms of telling and, and friends will say what someone's had and they don't fit the opioid toxidrome, they don't fit some of the other toxidromes, it can be hard. Someone needs to be profoundly intoxicated to be, you know, to have a GCS um, uh, of three. So it's usually based on the history and, and the classical toxidrome. They tend to be wearing their clubbing clothes. You could, there's sort of a, you know, they're in their bright coloured clothes and um, a lollipop somewhere in their pocket. And uh, so, you know, ecstasy doesn't do this. The, stim the, the stimulants don't do it unless, you know, you've had a, an intracranial event. So so, you know, we are cautious and if there's any, um, uh, uh, if we're not sure, the person gets a brain scan. If we're not sure, they get intubated, they get blood alcohol um, readings taken. Um, so it's not just that we, we, we leave them alone, we, we do make sure that it's nothing else causing these presentations as right, well. Lots of signs, no symptoms. Eh? Someone wants to know whether it's, uh, you get as much out of nitrous oxide as you do out of uh, GHP. Oh, so look, they're very different drugs and they work in different ways. Um, we do get patients, it's, it's very rare for us to have an emergency presentation from nitrous oxide, but we do hear, um, you know, of people who take nitrous oxide bulbs at parties as well. So the whipped cream bulbs, some of them are nitrous oxide, some of them are carbon dioxide. You don't want to mix those two up. And, uh, but it's got a very short half-life. There is a very small cohort of patients that get um, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency. There have been some dentists in the past that have abused um, nitric oxide and you can get subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord if you use it but that's using it a lot but you don't come in comatose from nitrous oxide unless you hooked up to it still and then we'll just take it off. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a role for flumazenil? It's been investigated, flumazenil, naloxone, um, phasostigmine, every antidote for every other poison. I don't know why people think they will you know, work in a completely separate toxidrome, but all three have been studied and, and none of them worked. What we do find is if you give naloxone to these guys, they might come up a point or two. There is maybe some opioid-related um, uh, effects. And we find that with a number of different drugs, naloxone can partially reverse them, but certainly it doesn't take a comatose patient like it would take a comatose heroin patient to awaken alert and in withdrawal. It doesn't do that in GHB. Okay, and what about alcohol intake? Does that affect the metabolism of GBL to GHB? I actually haven't looked into that specifically. There is obviously that alcohol dehydrogenase that converts the 1,4-butanodiol. Um, uh, I don't know exactly the kinetics in the liver as to... Because there does seem to be this cohort of patients that you wonder, you know, they're relatively experienced users, why do they overdose, overdose this time? So I do wonder if you take GHB, if there's quicker in onset, does the alcohol slow the conversion to 1,4-butanodiol uh, to of 1,4-butanodiol to GHB and delay that so you've had your GHB, nothing's happened in half an hour, you have another dose and you end up taking more than you would otherwise normally take. But I'm, I, I don't know the exact kinetics, the liver kinetics of um, alcohol. Maybe one more question. Can you share your sedation protocol? Absolutely. I'm more than happy to. So um, there's a couple of different schools of thought. And uh, in fact, my, my colleagues would be a little bit upset with me. Most of the research we've done at St. Vincent's has looked at um, the, the 
comparing combination therapy of antipsychotics with um, benzodiazepines and looking at, so, droperidol plus midazolam or lanzapine plus midazolam and comparing that to antipsychotics alone. And our research, that's intravenous. And our research showed that combination therapy was best. However, when I was doing my toxicology fellowship, I was exposed to the work of the guys in Newcastle and they were using intramuscular droperidol and I've become a very big fan of droperidol so um, we have amazing security at St Vincent's and we, we, we see so many behaviourally disturbed patients that you know this is something we pride ourselves on doing really well so it's very easy for me to get intravenous access and I'll use the droperidol intravenously 10 milligrams and uh, but if, if the situation is completely out of control I, I am and two doses has been clearly shown you give 10 milligrams about two-thirds of patients are adequately sedated after two doses you know close to 90 percent of people are sedated if I do get to 20 milligrams of droperidol I will add some midazolam after that, I have had patients, I used to use propofol, it just seemed to put them to sleep enough to let everything else kick in, but these days ketamine's making a huge comeback, and in fact, in fact, Ambulance Victoria using ketamine. I don't love that, I don't love my patients arriving comatose, um, and I think droperidol's a great drug. It got a terrible uh, reputation from a black box warning in the US for QT prolongation of torsades, and it's it, it just, touch it, it's all rubbish. It's been uh, really well studied, and it, it essentially doesn't cause QT prolongation more than any other sedative drug, so it's a great drug, droperidol. Okay.